excited to get started with tonight's study because our protagonist, Joseph, who was seven when we left him last week, is now 17 years old. So 10 years have passed. That's quite a bit of time. If you remember, they were in Shechem at that time, but they had to leave because Dinah had been raped. And then the two boys, two of her brothers, decided to go in and kill all of the men that were in the city of Shechem. There were still pe people living in the area, but they went into the city and, and killed all of them. And so we had kind of a scary story last week, right, Holly? <laughs> it was kind of gross, <laughs> disgusting, hard. You weren't here, were you? <laughs> Trust us, it was bad. <laughs> okay. So tonight, though, we're going to start. Joseph is going to be 17 years old. They have moved on to Hebron. And I want to just remind you that because Jacob was faithful and was obedient this time to move to Hebron, which was where he was supposed to go initially, that's where God had told him, he changed his name. And if you remember, his name has been Jacob this whole time. But now God has told him he's changing his name to Israel. And it's being changed because he is going to become the father of the nation of Israel. That's how the, the nation of Israel has gotten its name, is because of, of Jacob, who really is Israel now. And so God wanted to affirm in him and just approve him that he was being faithful. He's going to give him a new name because it's a new beginning for him. And so this is the beginning now of the Israelite nation. So before, we have um, had Hebrews that have been following God up and through the Old Testament, but now they will be called Israelites from this point on. So that's been confusing to you. It was confusing to me for a long time, too. But that's how the switch happened and how it came about. And so we see that they have settled now there. And I'm going to have you um, think a little bit about what it means to um, have a betrayal. Um, I'm sure that probably all of you in here at some point in time in your life have been betrayed by someone, right? And it might be something small, like, for example, um, I remember that a girl in my class in elementary school called all the other girls and told them what to wear to school one day, but did not call me. And I'm not harboring it anymore. I still remember it. <laughs> <laughs> but it hurts. <laughs> Do you remember those days? But you know, the hurts kind of get bigger as the betrayals get bigger. And so um, we want to just kind of look and see what happened with Joseph, um, the betrayal that happens with him in this story. But I want to start just sharing with you uh, a little thing that happened in our family. And that was, I had shared the first week about uh, my mom passing away when she was 61, she was quite young. But my dad lived to be 86, and he still lived on the acreage. As a matter of fact, um, we, I got a call from him to come because he wasn't doing well, so I got over there, and two days later he had passed. But on that day, my dad at 86 was still, Tammy, out in the barn with the lawnmower up in the air fixing it. I mean, he, you know, he had a full life. He had a great life. I'm really thankful for that. But um, when my brother and I were cleaning out the house, not only did we find um, that album that I shared with you the first week that we found the baby picture of my sister in, when we were cleaning out the garage, it was mainly tools, lots of tools. And um, my dad was, he could have done the whole HGTV renovation show because if you could do it with something he had, it would be done with what he had, a piece of wood. A, I mean, he was just, he can make do. And so lots of stuff. But back on one of the wooden shelves in the garage was a box. And in that box, I found pictures of my mom and her brothers when they were little kids. And I also found this book. It's called The Wonder Book of Bible Stories. And I kind of wondered to myself, you know, why did mom put this box out in the garage? I mean, there had to be a reason because her photo albums were all kept in a really safe place inside the house. But why, why, was, why was this out there? And honestly, I, I really think that I know why that it was out there. Um, when my mom was 11, 
Her mother um, passed away after having given birth to a little sister named Bonnie, who also died in childbirth. And so she was 11 when her mother died, and a year later, um, her dad, my grandpa Glenn, remarried. And my mom had two brothers, and they were not happy that my grandpa had remarried. They were very angry with him. And they did not accept the new mom. It was really hard on them. And, and you know, they were teenagers. I understand that, I get it. I, you know, it was hard. They were just kids, they were boys. But my mom took to my grandpa's second wife and she got very close to her. But the boys did not like that. And so um, they really didn't even hardly speak to my mom after that. And it was really hard on my mom because she had been really close with the two brothers up until that point. And so um, it was kind of like a betrayal in a sense. So in this book, I find this note, and it says, To Norma June, from your brother Robert, with love, Merry Christmas, 1935. So he had given this to her when she was, when they were kids, you know, when they were just kids. It was before World War II. And I think, you know, she loved her brothers. She still loved her brothers, and she still cherished them. She couldn't get rid of this because she still had that connection. But there was still a betrayal in the family, and it caused a rift in the family for a long time. Um, when my grandpa remarried, um, they had a, a daughter named Kathy, who is my Aunt Kathy, and my mom and Kathy were very, very close, um, and partly because I think my mom kind of helped raise her a little bit because she was so much older. But um, the boys didn't like that either, that they were close. And so it was hard. It was just, just a hard thing. And I'm just sharing that with you because there's hard things in families. Rifts happen in families. And um, there's betrayals that can happen in families. But I'd like you to know today that like my Aunt Kathy and all my cousins, they all get along great. We're all close. We still get together and things are, are well, they've been restored, and I'm really thankful, and I know my mom would be like so pleased about that. That would make her so happy to know that that restoration had happened. But another book of Bible stories, including the story of Joseph in here, so interesting. And when we think about betrayal, there is so many different kinds of betrayal. Jim and I do marriage counseling, and this is probably one of the number one things that can happen in marriages that where betrayal happens. And there's all different kinds of betrayal. It can be an addiction that one partner has that is kind of a betrayal to the commitment to each other. And sometimes um, beyond that, there can be betrayal, maybe um, an affair with someone else, or there can be just a lack of communication. There's so many different ways that that can happen and it hurts deeply within those relationships. And then there's also betrayal that happens in workplaces. Sometimes you're lied about, sometimes people have tried to usurp you by um, trying to one-up you in what you're doing, and so it can happen in the workplace. It can happen in friendships that you can have betrayal. There's, there's so many different places that it can happen. And if I were to ask every single one of you sitting here tonight, if you've ever experienced it, I would be shocked if there were any of you that have, would be able to say to me that it hasn't happened at least once to you in your lifetime, because it's very common. And so tonight we want to learn a little bit from Joseph's story. What happened to him? How was he betrayed? And then we're going to see as we, you know, as we flesh out his story, how does he handle that betrayal that happens within his family? One thing you're going to see is God's hand is still at work through all of this. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 37, and that's where we're going to start our story tonight, is in Genesis chapter 37. We're going to start tonight with a rift between brothers. And so I'm, I was going to start with verse 2, but let's just start with verse 1, chapter 37, verse 1. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. And this was that Hebron area that we were talking about. And these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, 
was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Billah and Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to the father. Now Israel, remember where Jacob is Israel, I want to make sure we're connecting the same person here, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. There was no shalom between them. No peace, no peace. So we learn a lot of things looking at this. First of all, he's 17 years old. And the wording that is used here indicates to us that he wasn't just a shepherd out with these brothers, he was the overseer of his brothers. The way this is written tells us that he wasn't just one of them, he was over them. And remember, he's got to be quite a bit younger than them because he is the 11th born child. So they were quite a bit older. And we know that in the culture of that day, and actually from what we learned this week, pretty much the culture of today, um, in Jewish culture, 17 was manhood. Um, kids, I think we learn, start going to school, and, but they start learning the Torah and memorizing it by age five. And they do that clear until they're 15. And then from then on, you know, they go into whatever occupation or um, into the, of course, they're all required two years of military today. But um, the, it was different then. It's different than how we live. And so for him to be 17, it's not unusual for him to be ch in charge at age 17. But can you imagine how these brothers felt who were much older than him? Put yourself in their position and how you would have felt if you had your kid brother telling your father what you had done wrong. We don't know what they did wrong, but we know they must have done something because he was the liaison between his father and this field work that was taking place. And so he goes in and tells his father that there's been trouble. And the brothers hate him. And you can see what's happening here. You know, there's that favoritism coming out again. And we're seeing a repeat of what has happened in the generations before. Jacob had been the favored son. He should have known because of what happened to him with his brother Esau that he should not repeat favoritism within a family, but he did and he favored Joseph, and it caused problems, big time problems. So that's where we see them. The two brothers were actually sons of Jacob's concubines, not of his two wives. Um, if you remember, he had two concubines and two wives, and so um, the conflict was there. We also see that he has a coat of many colors. And I want to talk with you about that. I, I chose this picture and this fabric from down in our costume thing, Sherry, because they're a little bit more subdued colors. When I was a kid and I thought about Joseph and his coat of many colors, I'm thinking about like bright red, bright blue, bright green, bright yellow. And first of all, they wouldn't have had that kind of dye back then to be able to create that kind of cloth. But um, I learned and found out that really his robe might not have had a lot of color in it actually at all. The word um, that is used here for coat of many colors in Hebrew is, is passion kitane, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but that's the Hebrew word. And um, about six months ago, I was at a meeting um, and we had been out for supper, and so I'm like sitting here and there's a pastor at the end of the table and one across from me. And I'm talking to the girl next to me, but I hear these two talking about how hard it is to put Hebrew into the English language. And Carrie Vander said to um, Pastor Paul Nather, he said, for example, the coat of many colors, we know that it probably wasn't all that colorful. And I was like, wait a minute, I've been looking at this for a year and a half. What do you mean it didn't have color to it? And so um, he explained to me that there probably was some ornamentation and some coloring in it, but it would have been subdued, more subdued. But it meant that the cloak itself was not short. It was clear to the ground, and it would not have had been sleeveless like a tunic or short-sleeved. It would have had long sleeves to it. 
And all of that would have indicated to his brother that brothers that he was the one who was going to receive the inheritance. He's going to receive the blessing from the father. And you can only imagine what, how this would set with the boys. You know, when they would see him and they'd see him wearing that coat, I'm sure that every time they saw that, I'm sure it just dug a little bit deeper into them. And so there he is with this coat, which indicates to everyone who would see him that he is going to be the one. And I think it's really interesting for us to take a look at that and to think about what that can mean for them. We don't know how Joseph responded to his brother's hatred at this time, but we do know um, that there was no peace extended toward him, no peace at all, no shalom. Now I gotta give you a little backstory behind this that slips into this family beyond Joseph, because this kind of takes place at the same time that this is going on. His brother Reuben, who was Leah's oldest boy, and he would be the oldest of the 12, has been uh, sleeping with Jacob's concubine, which would have been culturally completely unacceptable. It'd be unacceptable today, but it was really unacceptable back then. And because of that, you will find when you get further into Genesis, I think it's chapter 49, Reuben is going to get nothing from the father because he is just cut him off because of his, the fact that he has slept with one of the concubines. So that's kind of a little backstory because we're gonna come back to that moment again as we go on here tonight. So I want just to fill you in on that. But I want you to remember, even though there's hatred and division that's taking place and it's kind of reared its ugly head again, God is still in control and he still sees what's going on. So let's go to snapshot number two. And we're going to read Genesis chapter 37, which is where we're going to stick with tonight. And we're going to uh, start in verse 5. So we're still in Genesis. We're in chapter 37 and starting at verse 5. Now Joseph had a dream. And another word that we could use here in the Hebrew is he had a vision or he had a dream. So remember about his father, all the visions his father had. So now we see Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright and behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Are you to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. And then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers as if he hadn't figured out the first time. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I mean, he had to know, okay? It was not going over well, but he has another dream and he says, behold, I haven't dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in his mind, or he pondered them. Some of your versions may say that Israel pondered over these things. And first of all, Joseph. I mean, I'm just picturing myself with my brother. And if I had come and told a story like this, I, you know, he probably would have spit on me walking down the stairway, I'm sure. <laughs> I, or he might have thrown a corn cob at me out in, the, out in the farmyard. I'm not sure which. But it doesn't bode well, does it? It, it does not set well within families. And Joseph had a lot to learn. I mean, he was not tactful in his words. He was not kind. And God is going to have to um, rough, take some of those rough edges in him, and he's going to have to smooth those out because he's got some big jobs ahead for Joseph, and Joseph has got to learn how to be more tactful, to be more kind, to listen more, and to guard his words. And at this point, he is not doing that at all. But I also think it's interesting that we see that Jacob Israel 
is pondering over this. And I think he's pondering over it because he's had visions himself. Do you remember he had the vision of the ladder? You know, he had those visions. And so I think he's wondering in his mind, is God giving my son Joseph visions of something to happen in the future? So I'm sure he did ponder over this. Um, we read in scripture only a few times about visions or dreams. And when we do, it is always when there is something major about ready to take place. It's always then. It was Daniel who had visions in the book of Daniel where he had some great visions about what was gonna to happen to Nebuchadnezzar. He remember that man that stood with the bronze and the iron and the gold and his feet were clay and all of that. And that kind of came to pass where all those kingdoms folded. So that was in the book of Daniel. And uh, Peter um, has the vision um, where he sees a sheet coming down and there's all these unclean animals that Jews are not allowed to eat. And God is telling him to go to a non-Jewish home to Cornelius' house, and he's got this vision and telling him, you're gonna eat what used to be unclean things because the word from Jesus Christ is gonna be for the Gentiles as well as it is to the Jews. And that's when we know that we as Gentiles have the opportunity to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so those are major visions. So when those happen, big things are, are really coming and I think this is an indicator to us that something big is coming in Joseph's life also because of this vision that God has given to him. Um, and I'm afraid um, through this jealousy and hatred, though, that's been going on, um, you know, God's really got to do some work in Joseph's life. And the other thing I wanted to just share with you, and we heard about this again this year while we were in Israel, 1.5% of Israel is Christian today. It used to be a high percentage of Christians. It's 1.5%. That's not very many Christians living in Israel today. But the Palestinians and the Jewish people are actually have learned to live together, um, so to speak. But our news media and our political figures seem to kind of want it to stir it up all the time. And so what we hear on the news is not always accurate. While we were there, there was very little military presence, much less than when we were there four years ago. It was much safer feeling than when we were there four years ago, which shocked us because of what we see on the news all the time. Um, but the interesting thing to us that our guide shared with us, and I've heard this from other people before that are from Israel, Muslims are coming to faith in Christ, but it isn't coming from a witnessing like, say, maybe Kim would go over and witness to a Muslim and share about Jesus Christ. That's not how it's happening. It's through visions. They're having visions at night, and that is bringing them to Christ. It's making them begin to question their faith and it's, it's leading them to Christ. And we actually ate at a restaurant. The owner um, was actually the driver for, um, oh, can't think of his name right now, but he was a bad, bad guy. <laughs> I can't think why my brain is fuzzy tonight, I'm sorry. But he actually has come to Christ because of a vision that he had. And it's happening in, in for Muslims right now. And we need to be praying that God continues to do that. Um, I think that it's through our prayers that God will begin to answer that, and then more Muslims will come to know who Jesus Christ is. So visions, major changes that are taking place, always precede something major that's going to happen. Okay, snapshot number three. We're going to look at Genesis 37, and we're going to start looking at um, verse 12. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> we just ran away from Shechem last year, and now they're going to pasture their flocks there. The reason they had to do that, if you remember why Jacob originally wanted to settle at Shechem, was because it was a lush area where there was more green and the flocks could be fed easier. And uh, it wasn't though where God wanted him to. So in Hebron, at that time of the season, it would have been very dry. It would have been very desert-like. 
So Jacob or Israel has sent his sons with the flocks to the area of Shechem so that they have something to feed on. So they are pasturing the father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, here I am. So he said to him, go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron and he came to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the fields and the man asked him, what are you seeking? And he said, I am seeking my brothers. Tell me please where they are pasturing the flock. And the man said, they have gone away for I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. Now the area that he would have been traveling in is a very well-known um, path. And if you look at any of your maps from this time, you'll see what's called, um, it's called the Maris. And so there would have been a major traveling point from clear in the northeast outside of Israel and it would have gone all the way through and it would have gone through by Shechem and by Hebron and through Hebron it would have gone through Shechem and through Dotham and all the way down to Egypt and we actually traveled on that on interstate this last week because it still uses that same path it's a familiar path to everyone but now it's just that it's highway it's not just a dusty desert road but that would have been the path that he would have been taking to go find his brothers. And I don't think it's a coincidence that he meets this man. And I just wonder, was it an angel? I have no idea. But, you know, it's interesting. God, you know, he just puts people in the right place at just the right time. And he says, you need to go down to Dotham because that's where your brothers are going to be. So he is going to continue to follow this Maris path down to Dotham. And so let's just go on and see what happens. Verse 18, they saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They were making plans. This was intentional. This wasn't just an afterthought. They had been dwelling on this probably for quite some time. So they conspired against him to kill him, and they said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of the pits and that would have been a cistern at that time. Then, they will say that, then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him and we'll see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben, here's our Reuben, you remember that just had the affair with the concubine, heard it, he rescued him out of their hands saying, let's not take his life. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him because he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. Now, all of the commentaries I read, this sounds like Reuben's a really good guy, and this is a good thing that he's going to do, but most of them believe he wanted to restore him to his father because he wanted to be restored to dad to make up for what he had done with the concubine. So he's probably wanting to get back into his dad's good graces, but we're going to give him a break and say he did it for the right reason tonight. We'll give, him, we'll give him a break. So anyway, so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty and there was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat. Now, does that line just chill your bones? They, they want to kill him and they are so focused on what evil they're about to do, that they can actually sit down and eat a meal following that. I mean, that kind of tells you where their hearts are at at this point in time. It's just, they're really in a bad spot. Looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites, and some of your Bibles might read Midianites, coming from Gilead, because remember, we're on the Via Maris, so this is a well-traveled pattern. And they are carrying on their camels gum, balm, myrrh down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him for he's our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. 
Then the Midianite traders passed by and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. And when Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes and said, the boy is gone, where shall I go? But they then took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe after ripping it and put it in the blood sent the robe of many colors to their father and said, this is what we have found. Identify whether it is in your son's robe or not. And he identified it and said it was his son's robe. And his grief was so loud that no one could console him because he really had believed that his son had been killed by wild animals. You know, they took that robe and I just think this robe is so significant um, because they tore it from him and I think that when they tore it from him it, it ripped do you know what I mean it was like there was such a division now between him and his brothers it was a rift that would be really hard to put back together again. Um, their intentions were to kill him, but they did not. They sold him. And we're going to see that Joseph is now in the middle of a caravan and he's on his way to Egypt. And torn away from his home, his family, his father, from everything he had known, he's been completely torn from that. And so I want you to think about that a little bit, what that means when something like this happens. Um, when we have been betrayed in such a way that it completely changes our lives is very devastating. And I'm sure for Joseph that this had to be a very scary moment for him. I mean, imagine he's not speaking the same language that they're speaking. You know, he's going down to Egypt. Um, different foreign foods, foreign land, foreign people, everything. Everything that he had known, the favored son, I'm sure his life had been one of ease. And now all of a sudden, all of that has been stripped away from him. All of it has been taken away. Um, they had taken him into custody. And the favored son um, now was the symbol of a torn relationship with his family. It was an ultimate betrayal, one that laid heavily at their brother's door with lies, deceit, and a broken family. But I want you to know that in the midst of even all of this, God is still in control. And God still had a plan, and he's still going to have his plan go forward. Because even when bad things happen to us and bring brokenness and despair into our families, we have to remember that God's timing and understanding are above our personal understandings of things. You know, and I'm sad that my mom went through that season of brokenness, I am. But today there has been good healing and unity, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for my mom, sister Kathy, and how she has really helped to bring that about. And I don't know what any of you are facing right now today, you know. I, I would guess some of you even tonight may be in a pit just like Joseph was down in a cistern in a pit. Um, it's hard when you're in a pit, and you can feel like you're really alone when you're in a pit. But I want you to know that you are not ever alone, because I know for sure, without any question, that God was in that pit right there with Joseph. He was in there holding him with his righteous right hand. He still had a plan for him. He still was going to move and go forward with what needed to be done. And because of that, the whole nation of Israel is going to be saved because of his having been in a pit. And not only is the nation of Israel going to be saved, we are saved because it's through this line of Joseph's family that actually Christ comes through the line of Judah. We're going to learn about that in future weeks. But if the nation of Israel had not been saved, all of the plans that God had to bring the Messiah to this world would never have occurred. And so I want you to remember, sometimes when we're in a pit, it seems like it's never ending. 
that maybe perhaps you'll never be able to get out of it. And I don't know what God's timing will be in your pit, but I know that he is in there with you and that he is going to bring some kind of restoration at some point in time in your life. I don't know when it will be, but I know that he promises us that he will never leave us. You know, um, we just have to reminded that, be reminded, and it's so hard, God's timing is not our timing. And I'm sure that Joseph was wondering, you know, what is God's timing in this? You know, why is this happening to me? But we're going to find out. All of the things that have happened to Joseph up to this point, all of the things that you've been learning and reading about are all going to come into play when he enters into Egypt because they all had a purpose and a plan to prepare him for what he was ultimately going to be able to do. So I have to leave you there because I can't tell you what happens when we get to Egypt <laughs> because, you know, you have to leave with a little cliffhanger every week. So we'll hang on to that. Um, some verses I want to leave you with tonight, and then I'm going to give you um, what we can learn from tonight. Romans chapter 11, verse 33. Romans 11, 33. Paul says, Oh, the depth of riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Um, we, just, we just don't know what God knows. <laughs> you know, we, we aren't capable of knowing what God knows, but his ways are good, and he does want goodness for us. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary. You have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, <clears throat> may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I love, it's my favorite book in the Bible, First Peter. I love that book. But, you know, the trials that we go through, they refine us, you know. Sometimes he's leading us in a different direction. Sometimes he's leading us to a different job. You know, maybe something has been, you've been betrayed at work at something, but God may have something better for you, ahead for you, than what you're experiencing right now. So just remember that he's always, you know, helping us to grow in our faith. And then in Romans, Paul wrote in chapter 5, 33 through 5, Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So how do we live? We're in the midst of brokenness. How do you do it? Um, I read a lot from this guy called Ron Lambros. He's a Christian author, and he says this, God does not want our faith to be kept in mothballs. He doesn't want your faith in mothballs. He doesn't want it just put away in a closet and forgot about. He sometimes allows trials and testing to come into our lives. The unexpected hardships and heartbreaks that rock us in places that we never thought we'd face as a child of God. As a child of God, we never thought some of these things would come into our life, even though he has told us in the book of Matthew that in this world there will be troubles. But it's hard when we face those things. And it's in those defining moments that we knock off the cobwebs of our everyday faith and face life with a new and improved one that's empowered by God himself. It's in those defining moments that we knock off the cobwebs and we face life with a new empowered confidence. Because as we go through those things, and those you've been through things as a kid, as a young adult, as a, uh, a middle-aged adult, as you're aging, we go through things. And Hopefully our faith is growing deeper as we go through trials, that it's strengthening us and preparing us and using us so that we become stronger and our faith becomes deeper and deeply rooted even more in Christ. The one thing that I just want to encourage you in is to not become a bitter old woman, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Do not. <laughs> it's not what God wants for you. You know, we would love sometimes to seek revenge, you know, 
Or maybe I wanted that girl at school to maybe have a problem that day at school in my mind. I don't know. <laughs> But we, we want to do that, but God says it's his, that's his job. He'll take care of those things. We have to let God deal with these things. It's not for us to seek revenge. And so we do not want to become bitter. When you become bitter, you become enslaved, and um, your life is so unhappy. And I don't want that for any of you. So please remind it. Let, let's say that together. I'm going to say it and then you repeat it after me. I will not become a bitter old woman. I will not become a bitter old woman. Okay, we got that down. Good. We're good to go for tonight. So here's the three things that you can learn from tonight. If you want to write these in your book, you can on that last page of tonight's lesson. What can we learn from these three snapshots? Number one. Betrayal is real. You all know that already, but betrayal is real. It can happen in your families, it can happen in marriages, friendships, workplaces, and we know that if favoritism is there, that there's probably gonna lead to roots of jealousy and hatred. Um, and the other thing under number one, besides betrayal is real, is do not repeat betrayal in your future. Do not repeat it. We saw this happen from the generation before, and Jacob repeated it. But do not repeat those things that happened. Don't say, that's the way my folks were, or that's the way it was, and so that's the way I'm going to be. Don't go that route. Okay, number two, betrayal can lead to major torn relationships. Betrayal can lead to major torn relationships. Our use of tact, humility, and kindness in our words and actions can bring favorable results, though. Our use of tact, humility, and kindness in our words and actions can bring favorable results. And that's the lesson that Joseph needed to learn. He had that to learn, yes. Tact, humility, and kindness in our words and actions. And then number three, when you find yourself in a pit, like Joseph did, remember God is right in there with you. He will never leave you alone. When you find yourself in a pit, like Joseph did, God is right in there with you, and he will never leave you. And he can bring restoration to torn relationships. We're gonna see how that happens in Joseph's life um, and we're going to get a picture of how that is possible. Times of hardship and heartaches, you know, they can refine us to be used in greater ways, ways that we never thought possible, move us to different places that we never thought would be possible places for us to go to. But God can use us. So remember that God is always with you. He's never going to desert you, never. Um, it is with the testing of faith in God um, that there was endurance and character in Joseph's life that would bring him great abilities while he's living in the country of Egypt. He will be a foreigner in a foreign land, still worshiping and loving his creator, the one true living God. So next week, we're going to find out how God was faithful to him with Joseph through good times and through bad times. So don't miss out next week. It's pretty exciting. Okay? All right. Let me, um, I'm just going to give you a little prayer here right now, and then I'm going to ask you just to go to your table, at your tables. You're going to discuss the questions that are at the end of this in your lesson book for week three. So I'll give you that time to kind of work through those. Let me give you just a little prayer before we do that. Dear Lord, I just thank you for this story of Joseph. Um, just the truth of it, God. Um, we're so thankful that you have recorded these stories for us to learn from. And I pray, Lord, that the lessons that we've learned tonight, we can actually apply to our lives, um, that we can become the women that you want us to be, strong women with deep faith in you that can handle trials that come our way. In Jesus' name, amen.